about nearly a decade ago, I was coming home from a rap battle in Cincinnati, Ohio. On my way home, thinking everything would be fine, and the adolescent mind didn't recognize the stupidity of being able to, to bring a, an illegal substance over the border. I thought, oh, you know, it'll be fine. Sure enough, I got arrested at the Canada-US Customs and was sentenced to court. I show up at the court date not knowing what was going to happen to me. I've only heard about stories of people going, going to prison, and I could only imagine, OK, what's the next step? What is going to happen to, to my situation? And I end up going to court where they told me that I'm entitled to legal aid. So they actually told me to return for a second, for a second hearing. And the second time I returned, uh, an illegal aid lady who was representing me had to know every bit of information about me. So where I went to school, uh, where do I work, what do I do at, for a living. And I mentioned that I, I studied technical drafting, graduated with the Award of Excellence, um, pursued a career in drafting, and worked for a year and a half as a draftsman for a metal fabrication company to which I later dropped, quit everything, and decided that I would rather pursue what I feel is my personal legend or personal calling, which was pursuing the life of an artist. And I told my parents, I'm moving to Vancouver, and I'm going to become a poet. And under their breath, they would laugh and think, you know, I don't know about that. I, how about nursing? Mm, I don't know. It just doesn't sound as appealing, Mom. Um, but little did I know about the struggles that would go along with it. Um, as you may have heard, a lot of artists are not really starving, but they are you know, grinding it out. And um, when it came time to, to presenting all this information to the judge, the legal aid had said, uh, this is Mario Eugenio. He went to school here, here, here. He worked. Uh, as a draftsman, and then he's also spent some time doing spoken word and painting. And the judge stopped and wanted a, a definition of, of spoken word. He asked me, what is spoken word? Because it was an unfamiliar term that he had never heard of before. So I said, Your Honor, it's a fusion of literature and performance art. And then he wanted to know more. He asked me if I wrote my own poetry. To which I replied, yes, Your Honor, I do write my own poetry. Uh, to which he replied, go ahead. And by that, I took it as a cue that he would like me to perform for the courtroom. <laughs> to which I replied, when I was a kid, I wanted to be Bruce Lee. And every night in my dreams, I dreamt of directing my own movies and breaking a stack of bricks with my life fast kick. Day in, day out, I played that game of death, taking baby steps through several different sets of my films. But for some reason, I just couldn't sit still when the next lifetime came walking around that corner. It had appeared at that moment in time, the evolution of man had killed Bruce Lee, taking away every single form of living energy that existed inside me and sure, it really hurt my pride to see the game of death itself die, but a twinkle in the eye is merely just a twinkle in the eye. So when the past morphed into the present, inspiration met up with determination and both combined together to give my mind, body, and soul total creative control. And there I was, on the road to nowhere, playing the role of the chameleon, tiptoeing on the median, balancing alternate mediums. I wanted to be Michael Chang and play tennis in the US, hoping, hoping that one day I will be top ranked. But if all else fails, I'm going to trail from that veil to, trail from that trail to victory and cast away to Philadelphia where I could be bigger than Tom Hanks. I want to walk the green mile to the terminal, wait for Apollo 13 to take me all the way to the moon. But as soon as Private Ryan starts dying, I'm packing my bags and radio flying back home. 
back of Hollywood Boulevard where people could look up to me, living a life of luxury because I want to be none other than Sylvester Sly Stallone. I want to be Rambo and Rocky and have all these wonderful anthologies, and then I want to switch back to Tom Hanks right before they announce the winners of the Oscar nominees. I want to be on top of the world when it all falls down. I want to laugh when I cry, smile when I frown, be white when I'm black, black when I'm brown, brown when I'm white. Actually, I want to be whatever skin color there is in this world that does not get stereotyped. I want to be a perfect 10, nothing less. And on the side, I'd like to have some friends who don't think that I'm ugly, because if I do, I'll do what any other chameleon would do and change my name to Raymond so that everybody will love me. Great indeed is the sublimity of the eternal, but it is not what it is if you're trying to fit the square into the circle. Mom tells me, your opportunity does not always have to go so far, explaining how there's a bachelor's degree in nursing right here in my backyard, but with my head down. She asks me, what's wrong? And I respond, mom, that's not me, it's you. It's just not what I want to do. See me, I want to travel the world, twirl through time and find myself, by myself, for myself. I want to ride subway trains to work and take the long way home. Engrave my name in stone and stand alone while reciting some of my favorite poems, since it is what I love to do the most. Yes, I want to stand alone with the weight of the whole world rested upon these shoulders. And when I'm too high to tell, there's no way in hell I could do this unless I be myself. Only then will I say, OK, it's time to be sober. Stuff check, please. I realize I'm not a kid anymore. Therefore, I am not Bruce Lee. In fact, I am everything but a wannabe. I I'm a decision. I am a belief. I am freedom standing on its own two feet. I am not him or her, beautiful as can be. I am who I am. I am me. And the judge looks down at me. And he asks me, so you wrote that? Your Honor. To which he replies with his big hand carrying that hammer, and he brings it down <laughs> and says, absolute discharge. Get out of my courtroom. And don't come back again. And I got a courtroom full of convicts applauding me with a standing ovation. Yeah, brother, I fear you, man. True story. And I left that courtroom. What just happened? And it dawned upon me that I beat the system with poetry. That's some powerful shit. So there's a few lessons I learned from that. One, the power of words, being able to communicate and express your true self, so that people may view you, your true self, and see you for what you are. And vice versa, not to judge the judge, because what I found out from this judge in particular, I, I, looked, up, I looked him up, and I, I did a research, and I was trying to locate the, the judge's name, and I, I got close, and people who knew the, the system, knew of this judge. He says, he, they said, um, I was doing a speech at the legislative building, and uh, a gentleman in the back had said, I know who that judge is. His name's Ron. Ron Myers. Ron Myers worked on the board of Rainbow Stage, a drama company, for about 17 years. So underneath that cloak was a man who was passionate about the arts himself. You never know. And just to build off what I had said about the judge telling me, don't come back again, well, I came back again. <laughs> you know, life throws curveballs at you, and you can't always predict what's going to happen. And sometimes we learn by hitting a brick wall, and you're like, ah, you know, I should have not done that. Five years had passed, 
from the time that I was granted a discharge from the law courts, and I was at a, in, a, in a different headspace. My father was having money problems, almost lost the house, living under his roof for a year, not being able to communicate to him because I was just so frustrated. So all this anger and all this stress was built up in me, and around that same time, I had discovered another writer, Hunter S. Thompson, who, whose biography was just bonkers. The stories of, that, he, that, he, that he told, true life stories. I don't know if they're exaggerated or not, but they were crazy when I read about them. And in the beginning of his book, there's a saying, buy the ticket, enjoy the ride. And I took that and interpreted, interpreted in my own, my own terms and thought, hey, just do what you want. And so I had gone back to this free spirit and free mind that I wasn't taking into consideration laws and rules, so I was doing whatever I wanted to. And one morning, in my crazy young mind, I thought, hey, wouldn't it be great to make an art piece on a police cruiser? Yeah, I know, stupid, right? <laughs> now I see it. Oink, oink, in pretty pink colors. Oh, I have time to do the other side. Let's do that. Stupid. I go home, and I get a knock on the door. Winnipeg police open up. My brother answers the door. Like, Were you using my car this morning? Yep. And uh, sure enough, I get arrested again. Mischief under 5,000. They put me in a cell. Nothing to look at but yourself from the neck down. After being in there for three hours, they brought me into another room, blowing cold air at me, and they presented my art piece to me as a photocopy of the, the police cruiser with the spray paint. And they wanted me to admit to my fault. And while I was in there, I was battling this, you know, do I admit to my fault or, or not? And I decided I would take responsibility for it, which made their jobs a lot easier. And um, before they left to do, to do the paperwork, they, they are entitled to give everyone a voice. Do you have anything else to say, they asked. And when they asked me that question, I thought back to the judge and I thought, hmm, two for two? And I said to the cops, I used to say, fuck money with a passion. Back when there was nothing but drinking, smoking, and rapping. Laughing life away like there was no price to pay for staying out late, writing my name up on those trains. I never played the game. Instead, I went against it. Raised fist and all, splashing wall paint on walls, breaking laws with a smile. Mama's lost child who used to run wild with a low profile, playing at my own risk, paying no mind to the mileage, living like I was next on God's soon to die list. But oh, how it changes, how life rearranges how clear and present dangers suddenly seem safer. Forced into a corner, taking orders, chasing paper, thinking to myself how much I really hate to go to school, getting so confused about what I want to do. It's like go to class, kiss ass, or say, forget the rule. But son, it's much easier said than done when we live within a system that runs on funds. It's the reason why those stuck up kids steal the drugs, and the reasons why sometimes we got to leave the ones we love, work hard, get rewarded. That's just the way some jobs are, kid. You can't be an artist if you don't know how to market yourself. Pardon me for telling you all this. But you can't discard the facts because that's just the way it is. It goes, go to school, go in debt, pay it off until you're dead. Get up, get busy, get going, go hustle, do anything you can do to get through the struggle. Cash fools, everything around me, Cream, get the money, dollar, dollar bill, y'all. And the police officer gets off of his chair. He looks me in the eye and he says, I don't know what you call that, whatever that is, hippity hop thing. But take my advice and stick to doing that because that's brilliant. Not painting my cop car. You're going somewhere with that. And in that instant, I woke up. I could not do anything else but shake his hand and say, thank you. And he says, I wish we would have met uh, you know, elsewhere in a different setting. But 
I seem to think that I don't think we would have crossed paths if, unless this had happened. So some things are written, some things are just like, that were meant to happen so that we can tell this amazing story for Ted. Um, I took that, in that later that year, I took his advice and I started, I was asked by the Manitoba Arts Council if I'd like to start a program and share my art with students. Um, so thus began the workshop that I call Wordplay, which allows youth to express themselves and find their own creative voice. Um, so my role and what I've learned over time in the four years that I've been doing this is not to you know, put on a show and make it all about me. It is to, to share this gift and remind all the youth of their own power, their own creative expression, of the artist inside them that's been there always. As Pablo Picasso would say, every child is an artist, the problem is maintaining it when they grow up. So I believe that everyone is an artist. And when you combine those creative tools and then mix it with your own experiences and you tell your story, it's a very powerful thing. I mean, we build community because we, we have a common understanding. Um, I believe that true knowledge is shared knowledge. And so that, you know, we constantly build. We're social creatures and we learn from each other. And the more that we can come together and, and understand each other, the more we grow as a, a world, you know? So this past two weeks, I spent some time at Vincent Massey, and I was blown away by, by the youth that had, had come out of their shells, showed me who they truly were. Um, some of them in the audience out there, are they in back there? Omar and Michael, put your hand up. These two were incredible. You really blew me away. I wish I had time to bring up, you know, the whole class here for the 18 minutes that I've got. Um, so if you see them and you, you want, you're curious about what they've got to say, um, bug them at any time. <laughs> I'm sure they'd be happy to share. But at this time, I thought it would be great to, to share my time, our time, with another fellow speaker, uh, my good friend, Shante. So if you could put your hands together and welcome a young speaker. Everyone somehow forgot that I'm a human being with feelings and thoughts, and that I am capable of self-expression, just not in the most appropriate fashion. See, people seem to think I owe them an apology, not for mistakes I've made, just simply existing, as if my appearance insults them. Well, sorry, I forgot that this was your body that you gave me the privilege of inhabiting, that I'm just flesh and you are my conscience. Well, you really should have taught me to be a bit more cautious. How long will I have to scream, stop, 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 until my vocal cords are dry and sore? Stop, 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 I will screech like a scratch record and skip like a broken music box. Stop, stop, stop pushing every idea you have of what I'm supposed to be in my face until stop, stop, stop fades away distantly because I am suffocating. Listen to me. Dressing in baggy sweaters and ripped jeans isn't teenage rebellion. Didn't you know it's that unheard of concept called self-expression? Kids with eyeliner thick as highways, matted hair that's never combed. If I had it my way, I'd have bolt holes in my ears and tread that touch the floor. But unfortunately, I have standards to meet. You can't dress like that. You look like you were raised by wolves. Well, maybe I was, but don't treat me like so, and please don't make assumptions based on my clothes. This body is mine, my very own canvas, what appears to be a scratching post, and no, you can't have it. What stands before you is more than just an occupied shell. I have feelings, I make mistakes, and I have secrets that I don't tell. I'm finished apologizing for simply existing, so please just open your mind and start listening. Don't tell me to wait and be patient, as if patience is something I can buy in a store. Well, I guess they were sold out, because I still feel like an angry volcano about to erupt, and everyone keeps telling me to shut up, but I have a voice, and it's loud, and I refuse to turn it down, and you probably won't like what comes out of my mouth, but so what? These are my words, not yours, so turn off your ears and lock the doors, but believe me, it's useless. I'm really hard to ignore. <laughs> That's her first spoken word piece. 
So personal legends is um, a term coined by Paulo Coelho who wrote The Alchemist. And he said that you know, we go through certain obstacles. And the first one is overcoming that lie that we're told that things are impossible. You know, from a young age, we grow up feeling that, you know, I don't know if I can do that. Fear, guilt, all that seeps in. Um, and then there's an, uh, the second obstacle, which is when we realize what we like to do, but we're afraid of defeat. And that teaches us lessons to be patient, patient with ourselves no matter how hard it gets. Um, love is also an, obst uh, an obstacle because we're afraid of leaving behind those who, um, who may not sometimes understand what our personal calling is. And so we carry their baggage and forget about our own. Um, and the last obstacle, well, it's, it's when you're within the grasp of obtaining what it is you really want to do. But uh, you look around, and, and you might see some people who haven't found it yet. And we get confused with what our calling is and what theirs is. So I call it your inner superhero. Paulo calls it your personal legend. I think that everyone has a superpower. It's what you contribute to the world. And people always say, you know, that cliche quote, that very special quote, be the change you wish to see in the world. So find out what your power is. And you'll know enthusiasm, if it sparks enthusiasm in you, that's a good indication that you're on the right path. I got one more bit before I leave you. I got a joke for you. But uh, before I um, tell this joke, I wanted to welcome my good friends. <laughs> I started off and you should follow. Knock, knock. Who? Who is there? Lies the answer to your question. Who cares about a name when your God, my God, our God, their God, are really all the same? Same but different. Jesus, Judah, Jah, Buddha, Zeus, Brahman, Krishna, El Shaddai, Apollo, Mazda, Allah, Yahweh, or whatever you want to call him, or her, whatever you prefer, whatever is clever, whatever quenches your thirst for knowledge, who is to say who is better than the other so long as the lesson is learned, right? Wrong. So long as we belong to a world of oxymorons, we could go on and on forever and evermore. But if there's one thing I know for sure, it's that I'm not sure where, when, or how to begin to tell you all where, when, or how this is all going to end. I, I, I guess it all depends on what you believe makes more sense. If time is money, how much are you willing to spend? Can you afford freedom's expense placing bets on the chance that debt will have you running from the one who comes to collect? Let's try, na 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 try. Not to try too hard to make an educated guess. You will know when you know the divine secret shall be exposed and the truth to the innermost level of your soul will be yours to have and to hold, but only to let go of, let go of the pressure leading that die hard, try hard road that is ruled by time. Find time to forget about time on the fine line between the harsh reality and the sweet dreams where the treasures that you so longingly seek is always, always, within arm's reach. What you need, you already have, including what you have not unlearned yet. So try not, try not, try not, try not, try. Too hard to soften the blow. Instead, blow away the 
fearful breath that you continually suck in before you confidently speak of such things such as the way the universal pendulum swings back and forth across the source from which our wisdom da 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 dies and is rah, 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 reborn in many forms of opinions, life and death. It's like a palindrome poem, a party trap written in the stars and in the souls of the starfishes. And we are Om. Sweet Om. Anywhere our subconscious consciously chooses to flow with the rhythms of the heartbeats, vibrations, through trials, tribulations, in this ever-changing metamorphic maze. You teach you to be patient and brave the brainstorms when clear skies turn gray, when third eyes rain down drops that drip down your smiling face, through which you embrace what you lose again and again in this same, same but different place and space while your many faces change. And throughout it all, you will find harmony, asking yourself, is it false? Is it true? And all I know is that I don't know why this feels like deja vu, but it does because the joke's on you. Knock, knock. Who? Who is there lies the answer to our question. The end of the beginning, the beginning of the ending. We could go on and on and on, forever and ever more. But if it's one thing I know for sure, is that I've got a limited amount of time up on this stage and in this body to express what it means to be infinite. So I guess I'll just stop. Everything is everything, perfectly imperfect, just the way it is. Not. Thank you.